guys, it's Geekonomics here and welcome once again to the third in the series of my literacy series with regard to this book that we're reading and some of my sixth form all joining me in this great read by Joseph Stiglitz, The Euro and Its Threats to the Future of Europe. I hope that you're finding this really useful because in order to understand a book like this, you need to draw down all of your knowledge that you have gathered over the last two or maybe four years if you've studied from GCSE, all about the microeconomics, the macroeconomics and how that all ties together and knits together. It's quite a slow process reading a book like this because you do have to gather and assimilate all this information. But it will do you no end of good when you come to your A2, particularly paper three, the themes in economics, which is the synoptic unit, and asking you to draw down all of this knowledge that you know, both the micro and the macro, and to just tie it all together in one nice, cohesive, clear, understandable bundle. So, I have come back to the whiteboard today, ladies and gentlemen, because we've got to a really interesting part of chapter one. So let me just uh, refer to a few notes that I've made here, and then I just want to talk you through some of the issues which have been raised in this book by Joseph Stiglitz. This is really invaluable stuff for your A2 macro. So, in the, my previous video, we were talking about market liberalism and fundamentalism. Uh, Stiglitz does command that repeatedly throughout this book, but now he's moving on to a little discussion, as you can see, he talks about the rigidity and the problems of having this fixed exchange rate system within the Eurozone area. So Stiglitz says the following, with the creation of the Euro in 1999, money rushed into the periphery countries. So we're talking in the likes of Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, Spain. Those of you will probably know those countries better by the acronym, the pig nations, the pigs. And alongside of the money flowing in, the capital, as we would refer to it, flowing in, interest rates also came down. So borrowing was very cheap in these economies. Now that was all very well during the good times, but when things turned sour in these economies and recession really started to bite, well, of course, what happened to the capital? It all shot out of these countries. Now that, as we know, in economics, we refer to that as capital flight. Now, in the normal course of things, during capital flight, this is what would happen, and this is where we need to refer to our exchange rates diagram. People would obviously be ditching the currency, and as a consequence of that, as people sell off the currency, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that this would shift the supply curve of the currency from S1 to S2, and as a consequence of that, the country or countries concerned would experience, always good to put your direction of travel on your diagrams, the countries would experience a movement from E1 to E2 in the value of their exchange rate. Now as you will be well aware, that is known as a depreciation. And as I was saying to my year 11 students the other day, what happens when the value of a currency depreciates? The price of exports always move in the same direction as the currency. Learn that verbatim. Price of export, always moving in the same direction as the currency. Now as a consequence of that, of course, that, um, that restores some type of competitiveness in an economy. But Stiglitz goes on to point out that, of course, this was not able to happen in Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, Spain, because they were engaged and members of the Eurozone, this fixed exchange rate system. And so this adjustment process, as Stiglitz refers to it as, this adjustment process could not happen. Now what happened as a consequence? Well, Germany sought to blame the victim, according to Stiglitz. So it blamed Greece for being very, a very fiscally profligate country and said that Greece, if only it had stuck to the rules, it wouldn't, wouldn't have found itself in the dire straits that it was in. But actually, Stiglitz points out that actually Spain and Ireland, which had quite significant uh, budget surplus positions prior to joining the Eurozone, they experienced similar uh, recessions and depressions, 
yet they had budget surpluses. So, so clearly it wasn't all to do with the fact that it was just the Greece uh, spending money like it was going out of fashion. Now Stiglitz goes on to point out that various programs were then implemented for the likes of Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and Spain in order to, to try and um, breathe some life back into these economies. So they were designed by the Troika, that's T-R-O-I-K-A, which is three institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank and the European Commission. They all came up with policies which were intended to somehow shock these countries back into life. However, whilst they stepped in and lent money to the likes of Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and Spain, these the lending of the money came with very, very strict conditions about the economic practices that could go on in these economies. And these very strict rules actually often meant that the likes of the pig nations found that their countries contracted further and of course that then made it even more difficult for them to pay back the money which had been lent to them in the first instance. And looking back on and comparing where we are now to where we, are, we were uh, say 10 years ago, it's only Ireland um, which has actually recovered and returned to growth levels which were pre-crisis growth levels. So Stiglitz points out that um, the founding fathers of the Euro thought that the best way to the restoration of health of a country in recession was a huge dose of austerity. But if you think back to the 1930s and uh, Herbert Hoover, US President, 1929, well during the stock market crash he also thought that the best way to restore um, growth and prosperity was a dose of austerity, but actually that turned, um, the austerity then turned that uh, stock market crash into a huge and great depression. So perhaps uh, not the best remedy at all. So Stiglitz then goes on to point out that this, this process here is known as an external devaluation. So you, the fact that the, the currency depreciates, that's an external devaluation. And actually, it's a lot less painful for the residents of an economy than what's known as an internal devaluation, because the likes of you and I, we don't really feel this exchange rate depreciation, unless we're going on holiday or something like that. We don't feel it. But when you don't have this flexible movement, all the adjustment process and all the restoration of competitiveness has to come by what's known as internal devaluation. So that means trade union reform, it means slapping down wages, it means clamping down on price rises, it means structural reform in terms of um, opening markets to competition and so on. And that is a much, number one, it's much more painful for the likes of you and I because of course, as you'll know from your studies of John Maynard Keynes, Keynes said that wages are sticky in a downwards direction. We're all happy to take a pay rise, but please don't come and tell me that I'm taking a pay cut. People do not react favorably, as you can well imagine, to news such as that. So that's a very painful adjustment process. And Stiglitz argues that actually, what ought to have happened was that Germany, because their economy was doing relatively well, they should have let wages and prices in their economy come up. Now that of course would have made the German economy slightly less competitive and so if we refer back to this, the demand then for German goods and services would have fallen. So demand shifting D1 to D2 and thereby that is engineering um, a competitive external depreciation. However, it's not coming via austerity and capital flight. It's coming via the Germans taking on a, a bit of the burden of the pain themselves, demand for their goods and services falling, and consequently the value of the euro falling. But of course that would not only benefit and restore a little bit of competitiveness for the German economy, but also for every other member state within the eurozone. Now St uh, Stiglitz goes on to point out that governments in the afflicted countries they didn't want to tell their citizens that they had suffered in vain. And so, um, 
there's a very strong incentive for them to keep muddling through because obviously the residents of these economies, they're all taking the pain themselves, a severe dose of pain, and the governments of these economies don't want to say, well, all this pain has been in vain and we've decided that we're now going to, you to leave this Eurozone project. Um, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for today. A little bit there on internal and external devaluation, depreciation, and really useful stuff. And again, for synoptic units and so on, uh, tip-top stuff for drawing together information from different places. So I look forward to bringing you the next installment from Joseph Stiglitz. Bye for now.